changing centuries, changing, uh, really almost changing planets to move from the 20th century paradigm to this 21st century one. Shanghai is, um, it's not the only futuristic city on Earth, but it characterizes something about our current challenges that I think is, is unique to it. Um, one is that what we have here is a riot of architectural form which has become pretty much post-historical in the sense that there is an argument that up until the 20th century, architecture uh, forms a kind of narrative of progression. And uh, schools arise as responses to previous schools and uh, with arguments about why things should improve. In this moment, in this city and a few others, um, anything goes, literally. Any architectural style is available. And many of the, uh, the modernist forms of the 20th century, early 20th century imagination have actually been built, but with all kinds of super editions straight out of the, the Blade Runner handbook. Right? So one of the, the great pleasures of Shanghai is, is the unbelievable variety of astonishing architecture. Here's an image of Shanghai which uh, brings out some, of, some interesting things. This is the, the Shanghai Urban Planning Center, which is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, this is either the first or the second largest scale model on Earth. I, ha I said that one, it was the first in a talk, and a guy said, no, no, there's a bigger one in Queens. Um, I haven't been to that one. Not of Shanghai, but a, a scale model. This is a scale model the size of a football field. And it's, it's an incredible thing. You walk around it on these viewing platforms, and you see this, this uh, neutron-bombed version of the city. Right? No smog, obviously. No people. No cars. No bicycles. Um, none of the, the laundry and junk that hangs out of all of the balconies of every one of these many, many dozens of high-rise apartment buildings. Uh, it's kind of rendered into this um, mute, beautiful palette. Um, this is Pudong. This is the new side development of Shanghai. These three tallest buildings here, the time I was there, only one of them was built, the Jin Mao Tower in the middle. Um, this was all fishing villages just under 20 years ago. And people there were forcibly relocated to create this architectural fantasy land. Um, Puji on this side of the river includes the Bund, which is the, uh, the row of Art Deco uh, customs houses, banks, and hotels that characteristic of 1930 Shanghai. It's been preserved. What this overall uh, model gives you a sense of is the scale of the city, but also what you can only appreciate when you actually go down into the city is uh, the kind of temporal vertigo that you experience. That at the top of these, these skyscrapers, in the residential penthouses and the, the cocktail bars, you are living a kind of futuristic 21st or 22nd century life. And then you descend to street level, and it's almost like going back into the 1300s, the 1200s. You know, that people are still um, living in corrugated iron shacks. They are uh, squatting on the sidewalk and cooking their meals over uh, a little um, uh, heat source with a single walk for a family of six. And, uh, it's a, a remarkable thing that I don't think any other city on earth quite gets. Because even uh, Dubai, which is the other architectural fantasy land of the moment, doesn't have that reality at ground level. Um, so it's one thing I think uh, always worth thinking about when we look at these larger cities uh, around the world. Um, just quickly, I, I include this image because this is the interior of Jin Mao Tower, which uh, the top half of which is a Grand Hyatt Hotel. And when you check into the hotel, you check in on the 55th floor. And so you're checking in on the same floor, which was the tallest floor of the Woolworth building in 1911. A century later, that's where you enter the building. And when you register, they ask you if you want a high room. <laughs> And uh, you know you don't want to argue with with somebody who's well, what, you know is 58 not a high room? Um, because they grow, they go from 58 to 88, uh, 88 being a lucky number. Um, anyway, this is the interior looking down from 88 down to this is 56. There's a little jazz bar down there. This air shaft, this kind of uh, suicide conduit. Uh, <laughs> and I spoke to the architect who designed this interior, and he said when they when they tested these balconies, they wanted this feature, beautiful feature. Uh, when people were uh, modeling, exiting their rooms directly onto 
the railing, they, had, they didn't like it. It was unpleasant to walk out of your hotel room and just see the void in front of you. And so he imagined all of these people overcome by fits of despair, just pitching themselves right over. And so he came up with a remarkably clever solution. And what he did was inserted tiny little corridors in, in notches on all the way around and had the doors to the ho hotel rooms on the corridor. So when you open your hotel room, what you see across this tiny corridor is another hotel room door. And then you turn. And what I love about this is this is consciousness and architecture working together. Because the elegance of the solution is to see that that is enough to allow us to have a pleasant exit from the room, crossing of that threshold, so that we don't feel pitched out into nothingness. Um, remarkable. Uh, I mean, this is what makes great architects great is the simplicity of that kind of solution. And now just some images of the city at night pulling out. Now, in our own country, of course, the narrative of city creation um, is specific to certain conditions. And um, it's natural for us to think of our cities as bulwarks against the weather, uh, and indeed against the, the mythical lethal power of the North. Uh, I'm not sure that we've succeeded yet in really seeing the North as our frontier, as uh, Glenn Gould and others have argued. Um, but I, I think we are aware constantly that the, mo the majority of our population lives in a string of cities as close as possible to the southern edge of our landmass as we can get. And the great weight of that unpopulated um, hostile space above us defines how we think of our cities. Um, and I think this image here um, from the shield, um, the shield really plays this kind of hugely imaginary, powerful role in Canadian life. Um, these are perhaps cliched images, but uh, nevertheless, they are part of our Canadian canon. Uh, Lauren Harris here rendering um, an ice and stone formation. Even in somewhat more hospitable form, the, um, the snow is still present, and this conditions our sense of the external uh, that makes for our cities.